they identified top priorities where hospitals across the state would work together for collective improvement. Um, the four areas that the board identified that we would work on together as a state included hospital readmission, healthcare acquired infection with a specific focus on C. difficile or Clostridium difficile, um, improving the patient experience in hospitals across the Commonwealth as measured by the HCAP survey, and identifying and learning from serious safety events. In regards to hospital-wide readmissions, which is the focus of our discussion uh, this morning, we will be focusing on hospital-wide readmissions as opposed to disease-specific readmissions, looking at readmissions that result from patients who are transferred to post-acute settings, and also looking at readmissions that relate to toll hip, toll knee replacement. Next slide. For our collaborative collective work around readmissions, we've entitled the initiative Home is the Hub, which this webinar is part of that initiative, and we will be working together starting in June of this year through November of 2018. As I mentioned before, we will focus on post-acute readmissions, high utilizer readmissions, which is the topic of discussion for this morning, and toll hip, toll knee readmissions. We realize that to reach our um, desired goal, which is 20% reduction in all of these categories of readmissions, we will need to engage many partners outside of the hospitals. Our partners in the post-acute setting, our partners for cross-continuum cross work include the VHQC, which many of you have been working with um, prior to this initiative, and then continuing to um, engage the area agencies on aging for community-based care transitions work, and then providing and using data from both the VHHA and the VHQC. Next slide. So just in review, we started off our series at the beginning of the summer um, with our partner, Dr. Boutwell, reviewing the high leverage strategies that we will focus on together, um, including high utilizer and post-acute transfer readmissions. Then in August, we reviewed how we will use data to support this work and how we at the state and how you at your facilities are measuring readmissions. Last month, we did a deep dive into strategies for reducing post-acute transfer readmissions. And then today, we'll focus on strategies for improving care for high utilizers. Next month, we will actually have an in-person session. Dr. Boutwell will be here in Richmond on November 15th to um, work with you and some of our um, other partners on strategies for implementing the content that we've been discussing via webinar over the past few months. And um, we will be providing more information about how to register for that event. And then we'll end the year on December 15th with reviewing some of the early successes we've seen in 2016 and reviewing our plans for 2017. So at this time, I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Boutwell, who's been working with us since June, and she will lead our discussion today um, regarding improving care for high utilizers. Dr. Boutwell? Great. Thank you, Abraham, and welcome, everybody. It's great to be uh, here uh, for for this next installment in the Home is the Hub series. Uh, and uh, as you know, today we're going to cover uh, the work around improving care for high utilizers. The agenda for the session today will be the following. We'll review some key statistics uh, about high utilizers. And really, these are the bare facts that I'm hoping from today you will learn and memorize and take forth with you, whether or not you decide to specifically focus in this area, these, I've whittled it down to just a few key statistics so that you can be um, knowledgeable in your readmission team meetings and moving forward about some of, the, uh, so, some of the key facts and figures about high utilizers. Uh, number two, we'll, really, we'll talk about really almost the most important um, key competency in improving care for super utilizers, which is to really 
figure out how can we understand the root causes of, of utilization. And what I've learned in my field work um, uh, with uh, many dozens of hospitals across the country is that it boils down to uh, taking a new lens and a new approach to root causes called the driver of utilization. And we'll talk about that. Next, uh, I'll share with you some lessons learned from um, the efforts I'm working on nationally to improve care for patients with high utilization. These are all hospital-based high utilizer teams. These are all um, hospitals under the same pressure and incentives that you are in terms of limited resources, limited time, pressing, uh, pressing performance objectives, et cetera. So hopefully these are very, you find them very practical. And, um, and my objective here is for you to be able to recognize enough of these strategies in your own work that you can readily build and expand and adapt your existing work on, imp on improving readmissions to have um, uh, a, a slight focus and intensified effort on this subgroup, the high utilizer. And then finally, uh, we'll get into, I'll, I'll recommend a few specific action steps. Again, focus on feasible, focus on high leverage, and focus on getting your team started in a little PDSA around what would it take for us to intensify and focus our efforts on high utilizers as part of our overall readmission reduction strategy. The objectives here. Um, I hope that you will um, understand uh, my recommendations on how to define and identify high utilizers. I hope you'll understand the importance of identifying the driver of utilization and specifically not over-medicalizing the driver of utilization. And finally, I hope that through this webinar, uh, you will be able to see enough um, uh, practical, reasonable, feasible um, ideas that you for yourself will identify three practical next steps that you can take, again, to intensify and focus mission reduction efforts on this target population. So, some key statistics. First and foremost, high utilizer. There is a multiplicity of synonyms that are similar but not really the same, et cetera, and I've boiled it down here in terms of um, the common terms that we all throw around in population health and in target population nomenclature. And I find that uh, one of the most important first steps is to be specific with our language. So if we're talking about high utilizer, that means somebody who is here multiple times. It is not entirely the same as high-cost patients, and it's not always the same as a complex care target population. Now, as you can see in the overlapping Venn diagrams, high utilizers are often a component of a high-cost population, and high utilizers are often a component of a complex care population. But if we, one of the um, disciplines that I bring to, to, to my personal work is to really focus on what is the target population, what are the root causes of, of, of the issues that we're trying to address, and thus what are the strategies. And when I meet uh, high, uh, high utilizer or high cost, high, high cost, high needs, uh, high utilizer complex care teams out there in the field, I observe that their strategies are too intermingled uh, to be focused and to get results, at least in the short term. So do we want to improve care for complex patients? Absolutely. Do we want to improve care for high-cost patients? Absolutely. Today we're going to talk about the specific population described and defined by the fact that they're in the hospital so very much. Interestingly, they might not always be the highest-cost patients. And interestingly, as we'll discuss in a moment, they may not always meet some definition of medical complexity. So keep that in mind as we go through the discussion about key stats, 
target population, drivers of utilization, we're really talking about the group of patients who are admitted frequently. And I encourage you, as you move into your readmission team meetings, to talk about this. Ask yourself, do we, do we say, do, do we call this population high cost, high utilizer? Do we call it complex, high utilizer? Do we call it complex, high needs, high utilizer? And, and intermingle these terms. And if so, you might want to test for yourself just focusing on the specific term of high utilizer. As I move through the rest of this um, uh, presentation, I'd also like to ask your permission to propose some new terminology. Um, I am fortunate to possibly be the person who's as an individual working with the most high utilizer teams in the country right now. And it has emerged over the past several months um, that uh, really, although high utilizer is a term that we intuitively understand, it's a descriptive shorthand, um, we should recognize that it is um, somewhat indelicate it um, objectifies um, a target population in a way that I know we, we don't mean. We're just trying to say what we are focusing on. And I have been uh, uh, fortunate to be exposed to an alternative synonym for this target population, which um, is, is equally, I think, descriptive. And I think it's also somewhat, um, somewhat more palatable. And as you can see here on the screen, uh, a synonym might be a synonym to adopt might be multi-visit patients, with the shorthand being MVPs instead of high utilizer or super utilizer, um, which is what we've been using in New York. And really, in the next year, in 2017, we've decided in New York to change our nomenclature from super utilizer to MVP uh, because of the feedback and the consideration for whether or not this is the best you know, term to really adopt in hardwire. So with your permission, I'm going to start using MVP as my own practice change. And I hope you'll be able to remember that I'm talking about uh, multi-visit patients. And again, I like the specificity because it specifically focuses us on the group of people who are here numerous times. And again, it conveys that specificity around the number of hospitalizations that our target population has, and that, um, again, as we um, understand how to help them, I believe and have learned that multiple hospitalizations is usually a symptom of an unidentified or unmet need. So here are the only key stats I want you to know. So stare at this screen, memorize it, lock it away, and then you will be fully armed with the information that you need to move forward when you're in planning meetings um, and discussing uh, who multi-visit patients are. So uh, you can see, uh, and, and for those of you who are, I, I hope most of you are in front of the webinar, but um, uh, if you're calling in, we've got the key statistics of 4 plus, 7%, 25%, 60%. And the last stat is 38%. So what does this mean? Here's the, here's the article, and here's the, the data source. So what we have is when we look at adult non-OB um, hospitalized patients, we, and, and we define multi-visit patients as patients who have had four or more admissions in a 12-month period. So that's the first key stat, is my recommendation is that when you define multi-visit patient, you define uh, the target population quite simply and cleanly as four or more hospitalizations in a 12-month period. Uh, why four? Uh, well, it turns out there are two reasons. Um, and uh, reason number one is that uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality uh, has found in their analysis of multi-visit patients uh, using national data, including data from Virginia, uh, on an all-payer basis, that for Medicare and Medicaid patients, 
four hospitalizations is two standard deviations above the mean. So that is mathematically perfect. That's really what we mean by a so-called super utilizer or high utilizer or multi-visit patient. We are looking for the subgroup of people who are hospitalized much more than average. And two standard deviations above the mean is exactly what we would be looking for. So four is a great cutoff to use, and it's substantiated by the data. The next reason I recommend four is because over the past several years of uh, digging in uh, to this population as part of a robust readmission reduction strategy, I have gone, I have worked with teams in the field just like yours to look at three or four. It kind of seems like there's this native tendency to go to three. And I encourage you to test this yourself or save the time and don't. <laughs> but if you're, if you're vacillating between three and four, then the very simple, um, the, the very uh, simple test would be run the query as to how many patients have had three or more hospitalizations in the past 12 months and how many people have had four or more hospitalizations in the past 12 months. And what you'll find is something really interesting. I wish I understood the mathematical phenomenon, but there is a, a logarithmic decrease between three and four as a cutoff. And for any hospital, except the smallest hospitals, but for any hospital except the very smallest hospitals, four as a threshold yields a number of patients and a number of annual admissions that is very operationally manageable. It usually gives you, and again, operationally manageable depends on the size of your organization, but it usually will let teams from small, medium, and large hospitals say, yes, we can handle managing or focusing on that number of people with that many of encounters. So I really endorse the level of four because it's operationally feasible as well as it's mathematically the, um, the, the most, um, uh, the, the, the best uh, cutoff that we're looking for because it's that two standard deviations above the mean. Okay, the next number, the next set of numbers, 725 and 60, come from this graph. In Massachusetts, we looked at um, all adults of all payers, all diagnoses, a full sample, um, all adults who were hospitalized in Massachusetts, and of course we used the four as the threshold, so all adults who were hospitalized four more times in a 12-month period. And what we found is um, represented here in the dark blue bar, 7% of hospitalized patients, 7% used 25% of all admissions in the state and accounted for 59, call it 60% of each and every single readmission in the state. Any cause, any payer, any reason, any discharge disposition, just look at that cascade. 7% of people used 25% of admissions and accounted for almost 60% of all readmissions. If our focus is on reducing readmissions, and we are looking for high leverage opportunities, this is a high leverage opportunity. The last uh, statistic I asked you to memorize is 38%. And what we found, and uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality has found this as well, and I'll show you the Virginia data next, that the readmission rate for any person in Massachusetts who was a multi-visit patient who had been hospitalized four or more times in a 12-month period, their readmission rate was 38%. When you think about readmission rates that you worry about, right, you think about your heart failure readmission rate at 20%. You think about your pneumonia readmission rate at 18%. You think about your total hip, total knee readmission rate at 4%, right? So it's really important for you to know the, the readmission rates of the various target populations you're focused on, and I hope that you will learn and memorize that the readmission rate for multi-visit patients at the four-plus level 
at least for our Massachusetts data, was 38%. The interesting thing to me is that the readmission rate for anyone who was hospitalized in Massachusetts, one, two, or even three times, so that whole group of anyone who was hospitalized less than four times, their readmission rate was an astounding 8%. So to me, working on case finding day in and day out, we're looking for people who are bounce back readmissions, right? We're looking for people with certain diagnoses. And, and those things aren't wrong, but if you think about what this number is telling you, you draw a circle around everyone who has been here four or more times, and you draw a circle around everyone who hasn't been, which means they could have been here one, two, or three times. And the difference in that readmission rate is just astounding. Food for thought. When we looked at the top diagnoses of multi-visit patients, it is a mix of acute medical, chronic medical, and behavioral health. And so you'll see in the acute medical, the um, uh, very familiar diagnoses touched on before. These are the drivers of, these are all drivers of readmissions in Virginia and nationally, sepsis, UTI, pneumonia, cellulitis. Of course, cellulitis tells you that's where that's the diabetes, right? Chronic medical, CHF, COPD, diabetes, and sickle cell. And then behavioral health, air, mood disorder, schizophrenia, and alcohol. Behavioral health being broadly defined as psychiatric and substance use disorders. So when we think about high utilizing patients, what this teaches me is that we are not looking for chronic medical. We are not looking for specific diagnoses. We are looking for people right, who have that combination of medical, behavioral health, comorbidities, and then always social complexity goes along with this as well. Turning to some uh, information from um, the QIO, formerly known as VHQC, now known as Health Innovation Partners. No, Health Quality Innovators. Sorry, Carla. Health Quality Innovators, HQI, is the new name for VHQC. Uh, they gave us the high utilizer Medicare data for 2015. And I've shared this with you in prior webinars, but just to, to relate it to the data I was just sharing with you, uh, the QIO uh, pulled the Medicare data for the same cutoff, four or more hospitalizations in a 12-month period. And in Virginia, there were about 49,000 discharges among multi-visit patients and about 22,000 readmissions. And the important thing here is the readmission rates. 45% readmission rate. So again, what are you tracking and trending in your hospital right now? For sure, you're tracking and trending CHF, COPD, pneumonia, probably now cabbage, hip and knee. And I can tell you what those numbers are. They're all under 20%. And hip and knee, are, is, of course, is under 5%. So when we look at this new target population, this is why we're bringing it to your attention. This is a target population with a variety of medical, behavioral health, and social complexities, and their readmission rate is driving the readmission rate at your hospital. It's very high, and the good news is, is that experience suggests we can bring that down. Uh, the mix, of course, you could see of diagnoses is the same thing that, that you saw in the Massachusetts and we see in the national data sepsis, COPD, heart failure, renal failure, pneumonia, UTI, AMI. So you can see that's the combination of um, acute and chronic illnesses. In uh, the Medicare population, we see relatively fewer primary behavioral health diagnoses. That's not um, surprising. And if you look at the all-payer data, that's where your behavioral health primary diagnoses come into play. So. Moving into um, some ideas about how do we improve care for multi-visit patients and what are hospital-based teams, just like yours, doing to uh, dig into this uh, important population. So first and foremost, 
the once you have uh, run some numbers, which of course the first part of this webinar was all about numbers, once you have established a definition and clarity that we are taught multi-visit patients are people who have multiple visits, number two, pull your data at the four plus level, so that means four or more hospitalizations in the past 12 months, and you quantify that. You have a, that gives you a number, X number of patients who had Y number of admissions. Uh, and then, of course, the best would be if you also pull their readmission rate, which is somewhere going to be around 40%. So once you have your key definition and your key quantification of the multi-visit target population, the next core competency is to identify the driver of utilization. And this is something that I know many of you, your teams, um, have some mechanism in place to review readmissions. Um, and this is where I really am, tr am trying to emphasize that there is a slightly different lens and a slightly different um, perspective to take when trying to better understand the reasons why multi-visit patients come in so frequently. And it's probably just ever so slightly different from the strategies that you have for a readmission review at this point. So see if they are different or if, or if you're already taking this approach. So sometimes with readmission reviews, we have um, a very kind of straightforward analysis that's based on diagnosis and chart review where we say this person was discharged with heart failure and they came back with a broken leg and the case manager or somebody assesses that that is unrelated and unpreventable. That type of analysis is um, really quite, if you will, the, the inner core. It's, a, it's an okay place to start, but it very rarely leads to a broader understanding of true root causes. Because if you think about that type of analysis, what, what was the discharge diagnosis and what was the readmission diagnosis, and on the face of it, does it look like there was anything we, you know, that, that could have been done? We're almost trying to justify the fact that we couldn't have done anything. Successful teams take a different lens, and they take a lens that says, you know what, almost every readmission is related, you know, because this is a person. And the person's circumstances are what unfolded to cause the readmission. And they take a whole person view and a very holistic view. And this is, the, this is a cardinal feature of many of the hospitals in the country that I've studied who have hospital-wide results, who have the results that you all want to have. Um, and so this, I, I'm dwelling on this because it really does appear to me to be a differentiator between teams that are um, holistic in their view and teams that are, well, I'll just call it derivative um, in their view. So what do we do when we identify the driver of utilization? We ask why five times. Um, and so we start, we, we try to get the story behind the story. Well, why did the person, you know, um, uh, come back. And well then their doctor sent them in. Well why did their doctor send them in? Well because the doctor didn't have uh, information about the new cancer diagnosis. Well why didn't the doctor have information about the new cancer diagnosis? Well because we had the wrong PCP listed on file. Well why did we have the wrong PCP listed on file and now we can get to a root cause. Okay? So we really have to search and it takes effort which is again why I'm dwelling on this. It takes a little bit of effort, just a little bit more effort than a you know linear analysis of oh um, left with this came back with that. So ask why five times, and then especially for high utilizers, but really this would apply to everybody. Uh, but for high utilizers, I encourage you and excuse me, I just m messed up on my own PDSA. <laughs> for multi-visit patients. Um, uh, what we really want to understand is not so much about the medical clinical pathophysiology that's going on with this person, but we want to understand why does this person with this combination of 
medical issues, heart failure and cellulitis, whatever the case may be. Why does this person come in so frequently every year, but someone else just like them doesn't? That's where you start to understand this driver of utilization. What is it about this person and their circumstances, their coping strategies, their um, a, you know, response uh, to real or perceived changes in their clinical status, their ability to access ambulatory care, their preferences on where they access care. What is it about this person that is manifesting as repeated hospital use over time? Because they're the person just like them, with the same comorbidities, the same medications, the same age, there's someone else just like them who is being managed very well by their physician in the community. So there's something about this person that has a driver of utilization. And, uh, and when, we're, when we're asking why five times and looking for those drivers of utilization, one thing I've learned over uh, these many is very clever. I learned it from Kaiser Permanente that we want to listen for all of the factors, all of the drivers of utilization. There is never just one. And again, it's a subtle but profound distinction. Are we listening for all of the factors that led this person to repeatedly use the hospital? Or do we find one and, and, and think that there's one silver bullet that we just need to work on? In the process of having these discussions and, and identifying the driver of utilization, Always, always, always. There's the clinical component, there's a behavioral component, and I say behavioral in the broadest term. Behavioral being psychiatric or substance use or behaviors, learned behaviors, coping strategies, preferences, care-seeking patterns. Listen for all of that because that is almost always a component of the story of a multi-visit patient. And then, equally as important and not last, the social needs. What is it about the multi-visit patient that is meeting some of their needs? It might be maladaptive, but the meeting some of the social needs that we might not have fully appreciated or addressed in the past. All of this is to say that once teens get underway and start identifying the driver of utilization, it's a universal finding, and this is with teams that include the chief medical officer and the chief of the ED and the chief of the hospital medicine. It's universal that we start to peel away the medicalized lens and we start to really look at behaviors, circumstances, care-seeking patterns, social factors, etc. So here are two stories of my multi-visit patients at Mass General Hospital um, that I learned a lot from interviewing these two people and understanding this concept of multi-visit, of, um, excuse me, the driver of utilization. The first is, was a man I met on a snowy March morning. <laughs> Abraham will remember because it was the winter I got snowed out from joining you in, this, in January. So I met, I met this uh, gentleman on a snowy March morning, and he had already had eight hospitalizations from January to March when I met him. All hospitalizations were for shortness of breath, and guess what he was back for? Shortness of breath. So this gentleman, uh, 61, he was Medicaid, and, uh, and he had every single reason from a physician's perspective to be short of breath. He had systolic and diastolic heart failure. He had obstructive sleep apnea and wasn't using his CPAP. He had pulmonary hypertension. He had COPD and he wasn't using his oxygen and he still smoked. He was morbidly obese and he wasn't going to PT. Right? So every single day, if you think about it, any day of the week, any time of the day that this gentleman shows up to my emergency room with that clinical profile and says, I'm short of breath, what's going to happen? Predictably, every single time, and this is exactly what happened, every single time he gets sent upstairs. 
because he's what? Quote, complex. So I said, geez, this is a great opportunity for me. And I cleared my schedule, and I went, and I sat, sat down, and I said, Mr. So-and-so, I uh, get my life's work to try to improve care for people who are in the hospital frequently. I'm really interested in your feedback about the care you get here at Mass General. And, you know, if there's anything, anything at all, the sky's the limit. No idea is off the table. Is there anything at all we can do differently so that you don't have to be here so very much? And what happened was something that I will never forget, and it was very profoundly educational. He shuffled back on the bed, picked up the remote control and the meal menu. And he said to me, ah, oh, honey, I'm in here every couple of weeks, and it always takes him about four or five days to tune me up. I'll be back again. So what did I learn? I learned that Subsequently, I learned that he was not bothered by being in the hospital very much. And further um, looking into it revealed information that the floor case managers and the floor social workers had known about this guy for years. This was not new information, but it was new information to me uh, when I learned that he lived in a single room occupancy apartment. When he was out on his own, he ate one meal a day from McDonald's. He did not have cable. He did not have reliable heat. And <clears throat> he had a criminal history, which made placement problematic over and over again. And you know he was clearly socially isolated. And so <clears throat> on a very human and humanistic level, we can now understand that it is immensely more um, comforting and uh, enjoyable and meets his needs overt and uh, subliminal uh, for companionship, for interaction, for heat, for cable, for three meals a day, um, for you know a caring human interaction. There are so many reasons why he brings himself into the emergency room and he seeks to be hospitalized. And if we went after his multi-visit patient scenario by doing the same thing that, quite honestly, we had done for years, pulmonary consults, cardiology consults, PFTs, get RT in here to optimize his CPAP that we know he never uses it, discharge him to tell him to follow up with pulmonary cards, PT and, and, and PCP, which had been his discharge plan for three years. Why would we keep repeating that, right? Um, it's because it's, those are the tools that we have at our disposal. That is the lens that we take day to day. And what I hope you'll remember from this man's story is, yes, uh, this uh, in, in some other ways he could be seen as a, quote, difficult patient. In some other ways he could be seen as, quote, malingering. Uh, however, in some other ways you can see that he is actually quite effectively getting his needs met. And what we're going to need to do in order to address his high frequency hospitalization is we're going to need to address the preferences and the behaviors and the social circumstances, right? That is our only hope for getting to the root cause of this person's multi-visit situation. And I promise you that the pulmonary consultant does not have much more to offer than has already been offered over many, many years in many, many consults. The next gentleman uh, also taught me a lot <clears throat> about this uh, phenomenon. He was a 32-year-old man, so young, and, and I'm, I'm sharing with you young multi-visit patients on purpose because we often think about the older person at the end of life who's not ready to make end of life decisions, and that, that's a very important group of patients too, but I'm trying to broaden our thinking for all patients, all multi-visit patients, all ages, all payers. Okay, so this next gentleman was also a patient of mine at Mass General, 32 year, years old, um, and he came in uh, with a chief complaint of chest pain. I mean, flank pain. I mean, have I mentioned that I have a stroke? Um, and it was that to a keen internist, to a keen hospitalist, 
to have migrating chief complaints was my first tip in a young man. And uh, so I looked into this, or so, so he was presented to me at rounds, and the intern presented him to me um, as if it had been the first time this gentleman had ever come to medical attention. And so I learned about his heart attacks. Uh, this is a tragic, uh, tragic uh, medical history of a lifetime of uncontrolled diabetes. So he had already had heart attacks. He had already had strokes. He had already had an amputation. He had um, a stage four chronic kidney failure. Uh, and he had bipolar disorder. He had a criminal history and he had substance use history and he was homeless. So when I met him and, uh, sorry, when uh, at rounds, you can imagine that this that he had already had a million dollar workup sent off and we were consulting every single service and we were spinning his urine and we were ordering stress tests and MRIs and the whole thing because guess what? This happened to be his first presentation to Mass General. But was it his first presentation to a hospital? Of course not. Of course not. And I canceled all the workup and I walked up to him and I said, gee, Mr. So-and-so, I'm happy to tell you, you look great. I think everything's going to be just fine. But what I want to ask you is, where have you just been? And then over the next four days, uh, he very readily um, signed uh, permission for me and a medical student to get his uh, medical records from the other 10 Boston area hospitals. And we put together a profile of him and learned that he had been released from prison 180 days before I met him. And uh, he was given a one-way train ticket uh, from the prison to South Station in Boston, and he had zero in his pocket, no money. Uh, he stayed on his mom's couch for a couple nights before she uh, told him he couldn't stay there anymore, and then he was on the streets. He has diabetes. He understands that. He has medical complexity. He understands that. Um, and what had happened was, again, out of a survival instinct, we put together a, a, a documented pattern that out of 180 days of freedom since he left prison, he had been in an emergency room or a hospital bed 140 out of those 180 days. So I said to him, gee, Mr. So-and-so, and I showed him the graph. We made this beautiful chart. I said, uh, seems to me like you're living in the hospital. Is that right? And he said this. Yes, he said, I need housing, not a shelter. I need someone to help make sure I take my medicines. In a shelter, they don't do that, and they kick you out every morning. I need a stable residence, and no one is able to help with that. And unlike the first gentleman, this person was transparent. He was intelligent. He was correct. He was insightful. He was, I mean, he, this is a direct quote from him. Would you expect that direct quote from this person that I just described? Never in a million years. And when we asked him, gee, it looks like you're living here. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he knew exactly why, and he knew what he needed, and he's right. He is right. And what had happened time and time again was he was discharged to a shelter. And so, again, no easy answers. Uh, this is a long-term problem to help him solve, but until somebody takes up the mantle of trying to engage with him over time, uh, navigate the system, advocate for his needs, right, and help him connect with the services that he needs, which are not actually medical. They are housing with services. And I just thought that this was the most profoundly educational story I, I could ever have uh, encountered myself as well as share with you. So again, if you look at the charts of these two gentlemen, you could go down an entire pathway about medical complexity, and neither of these people need that in order to slow their hospital utilization. And that's what I mean by getting to the driver of utilization. Okay. So how can you do that? Well. I, mostly, what I've learned is that no one tool is necessarily um, 
helpful. Um, we have, uh, in the York Hospital Guide to Reducing Medicaid Readmissions, we have refined a readmission interview tool over the 10 years since I was at IHI, and we developed this then. And we, so we've refined it over time. And really what I think a tool is most helpful for is to empower the staff to initiate these conversations if they have never had such conversations before. Here are a few barriers I've heard from hospital teams over the years. Well, if we ask about readmissions and why someone came back to the hospital, are we not exposing ourselves to risk? What would risk management say about this? Are we acknowledging that we did something wrong or incompletely? And, you know, not at all. And, uh, and so that's where you see at the top of this tool um, a, you know, a suggested script and framing in the sense that um, this is all about quality improvement and improved service delivery, and this is going to help you with your age caps as well as identify root causes of readmissions. And patients are universally happy to have these discussions. Now, they won't all be as uh, rich of a discussion as the two I shared with you. Sometimes patients say, my doctor told me to come back, and so I came back. But of course, what you can then observe and infer, and you ask why five times, and you go to the doctor, and you look back to the circumstances beyond that. So there's not always a, a robust uh, and detailed, insightful discussion that comes from uh, the interview, but it is the beginning of the process of asking five whys. What, practically speaking, the script, I think, is helpful for framing. It's helpful to use the first five or 10 or 20 times you have these conversations. But what some of my super, super utilizer teams um, in New York have come to realize is that really this is about motivational interviewing. And so if your staff has the grounded skills already, or if you're going to train them up in motivational interviewing, that's, that's really the um, type of skill set that we're trying to prompt here through this tool. Um, again, uh, my recommendation is that you have an interview like this with all multi-visit patients, all of them. And you know what? There are only one or two or three a day, depending on the size of your hospital. So this is not overwhelming. Interview all multi-visit patients. This is the only way you're going to possibly be able to identify how to get to their driver of, uh, of, it, of utilization in order to address the real reason why they're coming in. And then as a best practice for your readmission reduction strategy overall, again, the hospitals that have results most often review every readmission. So now, once you know your data, once you have a definition, you know your data, and you have developed some uh, of this first order, most important competency in identifying the driver of utilization, what do you do at that point? So here is, uh, of course, this is a, a huge topic, uh, one that has been the source of a, you know, a lot of good, good work and important research over time. Uh, but here, I would say, are the first three steps um, to incorporating a focus on high utilizers multi-visit patients, I apologize, into your readmission work. Okay, number one is real-time identification. What I mean by that is you are looking for readmission risks already among your patients who are hospitalized. Maybe you're using the Boost AP tool, or maybe you're using a LACE score, or maybe you're using um, a clinical assessment, which is my preference, you know, where you're looking for uh, patients who have social, clinical, and uh, medical risks that would likely um, place them at high risk of readmission. All you need to do to focus, to expand your lens, uh, is to look for people who have this multi-visit patient phenomenon. And so you just ask yourself, has this patient been in the hospital four or more times in the past 12 months? You can ask the patients. Uh, you can um, even better. And the best practice would be to um, have an automated flag in the chart to, because this is very easily automated. So you can have a flag in the chart to say this is a multi-visit patient. This is their fourth or more admission in the past 12 months. That's what all of my teams do. Just be very clear about that. 
automated flag. And for any team that says, well, we don't, you don't understand, we can't do that, well, you have a flag in the chart for MRSA or isolation precautions or fall precautions. There's always, every, every EMR has a mechanism to flag and keep a flag on a patient's record. So use that same mechanism is what I've learned. Okay, so real-time identification. We are looking for patients with the condition called multi-visits. Just like you look for patients who need, um, uh, who, who, who need to be placed on isolation precautions, you look for patients who need to have you know, uh, core measures um, attended to, et cetera. Number two is, of course, identify the driver of utilization. Um, which I just uh, talked about. Number three is then the logical next step is address or start to address the driver of utilization. And the uh, I'll talk about this in the subsequent slides, but the key features of addressing the driver of utilization is high frequency contact after they leave, problem solving for these big problems or behavioral or social problems needs to occur over time. And that's where we move from an episode-based healthcare delivery system to a population management system because these, this population personifies the fact that there are never quick fixes. And this is our great opportunity to build that capability in population management to say this person it has a set of problems and drivers of utilization that it's going to take time, weeks to months, not hours. Um, and often uh, the skill sets that are native in social workers and navigators are very effective for helping this population. Number four, we'll get to again uh, in more detail, is use care plans to convey, to share this information about utilization history the drivers of utilization, what, you're, what you and the team and the cross-continuum team are doing to put services into place, and bring that information into the emergency room where um, at, at a glance, a busy emergency, uh, emergency medicine provider can have an executive summary of this multi-visit patient, just like my 61-year-old gentleman, and say, oh, aha, there's a team who knows this person. Uh, his shortness of breath uh, pathophysiology is well described. It's been well evaluated. He has the recommendations in place he needs. Actually, this team has identified that there is a behavioral component to this utilization, and they're recommending to me that I you know, discharge the patient with follow-up um, among the high utilizer team, we'll just say, um, or the complex care team, and, and avoid admission if if it's at all clinically appropriate to do so. So that's, those are kind of, if I had to boil it down, those are the four major feasible um, strategies that hospital-based high utilizer teams are taking um, in order to, to start down the path of improving care for MVPs. So let's talk a little bit about that um, in e each of those in turn. Identify and engage in real time. So there have always been um, care management, complex care, um, outreach type disease management teams in place. You know, the payer community has, has had these in place for a long time. And, uh, and the biggest limitation, we'll say, to a plan, uh, a plan's complex care management program, the biggest limitation is usually uh, the limitation of case finding and engaging and encountering the person they're looking for, because usually this is being done telephonically. As hospitals, we have a uh, unique and irreplicable opportunity that really primary care doesn't have, uh, health plans don't have, um, almost nobody else has this. Is the person is a high utilizer, multi-visit patient, because they're here. They brought themselves here, or somebody brought them here. They are here, they are here now, they are in front of us. We do not have a case-finding problem. 
right? And so that really differentiates the opportunity to work on high utilizer patients from anyone else, if you think about it, even primary care. Because very seldomly do multi-visit patients frequent primary care. You, primary care may very well want them, want to engage them in primary care, but classically the story will be that they don't show up to primary care, they show up to us. So that is a very important distinguishing point as to why hospitals um, have a unique opportunity to initiate a different care pathway for multi-visit patients. They're here, they're now. Number one, two, and three is to prioritize engagement. And what does that mean? That is a skill. That is not a quick drive-by to say, oh, hey, we want to put you in a, a complex care program. Can you sign these five um, releases of information and permissions and commitments to uh, in, enroll in our program? That is not, uh, we've tried that. I'll just tell you. We've tried that. That is not the way to go. Over many, many teams and many, many months of work, we have learned that we need to prioritize a very um, human, social, relationship-based engagement. We need to approach the um, person to understand, again, their drivers of utilization, what they want, what their needs are, what their concerns are, and establish a trusting and helpful relationship. Again, many of our uh, psychiatry colleagues would tell us that in, to a large extent, multi-visit patients have been promised things and disappointed by people over and over again in their lives. For those of you who are familiar with trauma-informed care, this is a, uh, a rich um, domain uh, of using those skills. So we need to establish a trusting and helpful relationship based on demonstrating that we are willing and able to understand their needs and, and priorities and that we're, the key here is not leading with a medicalized agenda. Um, you know, the kiss of death is to say, um, I'm here to help you get to your doctor's appointment. Really. If that, that's so dissonant usually with what they want and what they're interested in, that it's a very common, I, I, I raise that example because it's a very common mistake that any of us would make. I'm here to help you get to your doctor's appointment as if that's what they really want, right? So this is again where multi-visit patients teach us so much about population health, about managing care, engagement, uh, the importance of understanding how to approach people uh, from a, again, trauma-informed perspective, using mo mo uh, excuse me, motivational interviewing, and understanding that if we want to address a cycle of utilization, then we need to demonstrate that we are going to be helpful. It's a high bar. Um, okay, number two is the uh, recommendation I made to the New York teams that took off like wildfire apparently. Simple recommendation, we must do something different. If you think about that gentleman, the 61-year-old gentleman who had the same discharge plan, and you know what, on paper it's not the wrong discharge plan, is it? You know, follow up with PT and, uh, you know, use your stop smoking and use your CPAP and lose weight and mo moderate your salts and moderate your calories and, and, you know, do this and do that and follow up with these outpatient providers. That's, that's actually quite an A-plus discharge plan, isn't it? But once somebody becomes a multi-visit patient, we need to look at that A-plus discharge plan and say, wait a second, this might be the right advice, but it, is it is it meaningful? Is it helpful? So we want to um, take the approach that we, we push ourselves to figure out what are we going to do this time that's different. And from numerous focus groups and teams that are doing this work, these are the verbs that uh, they use to describe their work. We arrange for, we coordinate, 
we follow up, we navigate, we advocate, we check in, we reassure. I think these are excellent verbs for what doing something different means. This is a quote from one of the teams uh, that I work with where they said, uh, with regard to doing something different, we were calling it management. How do we manage the MVP? Management starts with the hospital-based team, not just assessing and referring, but initiating and for some amount of time providing the active follow-up and support with the goal of definitively linking the patient to the services and supports required to reduce utilization. And so again, that is not so far away from what your transitional care programs look like, I'll bet. For those of you who have any sort of services, um, transitional care services that extend into the post-discharge period, that's probably what you do. Initiate, provide, follow up, support, and definitively link. So again, I want to reassure you that this is not that different from a um, a 30-day readmission reduction program uh, it, for those of, those of you who have one of those in place. And if you don't, then you know this is is kind of the model that um, that you you would probably want to think about as you intensify your efforts to to really drive down readmissions. The next domain is collaborate. So the idea is not is 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 no no um, as I said before, no multi-visit patient has a single issue problem, and so what teams find is that we really need to um, scan the environment and for and uh, develop the types of partnerships, close partnerships with community agencies um, and others that can work to address these long-term issues among our multi-visit patients. So this is really saying um, that we need to look to think about who else can bring long-term, basically long-term care management or long-term solutions to this multi-visit patient's you know, key drivers of utilization. And, uh, and so you want to identify and engage who those providers, agencies, or payers are. And then, of course, coordinate, collaborate, align plans, and leverage each other's efforts. You know, we never want to see duplication of effort, but if the hospital uh, can say that, okay, we'll identify the person the next time they come in, we'll engage in an appropriate and an effective way, we will, um, you know, assess and reconfirm the driver of utilization, we will then coordinate and collaborate with you, whether it's an agency, whether it's a payer, uh, whether it's a provider, uh, to, um, to uh, develop the plan and, um, and ensure that we are advancing uh, progress on reducing this cycle of utilization together. So this is not, although, I, although we're talking about what can the hospital team do, this uh, collaborate part is very much the partnerships you want to mobilize because you're going to, inevitably, everyone needs to rely on a multi-sector um, approach really to helping these folks. And as one chief of the emergency room said here in a, uh, a, a very simple quote, um, he said uh, this was all new to him, and he said that he his big lesson learned from the first year of their superutilizer work was, quote, the multidisciplinary team is really needed to do this. We need to rely on other expertise. And I share that with you because this was from the chief of, of the emergency room who pretty much thought that that you know the emergency room was going to be the source of all the answers, right? And again, I don't say that out of criticism, I say that out of relating to him and to that perspective, that we think that we have to solve this issue, that we're the one who has to do everything. And when we feel like we have to solve problems, we naturally limit our option set. Because if we, if we find a person who is marginally housed or socially isolated, well, it's not within our option set 
to address that. So that's when we throw up our hands and start saying this is a difficult patient, a complex patient, you know, this is this is not medicine, it's beyond our scope of practice. And what this chief of emergency medicine's quote here is reminding us that we all need to develop the, you know, at the to the best of our abilities, the understanding of how to collaborate, especially with um, uh, providers outside of our organization and services in other sectors, not just medicine. And finally, um, the, 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 the last key concept that has emerged as um, helpful in, in these teams is the concept that what we're trying to do here, what is our outcome? Our outcome is stability. We are trying to take someone from a, a phase of high utilization to stabilize their needs and get them to a lower level of utilization. It never means no utilization. Again, with readmission work and high utilizer or multi-visit patient work, we are not trying to keep people out of the hospital if they need to be in the hospital. As you all know, I am a hospitalist. I just had a couple great shifts over the weekend where I had you know, great shifts, meaning I had people on my service who were really sick. They really needed to be in the hospital. They needed the nurses. They needed the RTs. They needed the charge nurses coordinating things. And every once in a while, they needed me putting my two cents in. It was wonderful. When we have patients in the hospital, we're using the system the way it should be. It is we are doing the right thing. What we're trying to do here is um, reduce that unnecessary um, uh, cycle of utilization that in my mind now really represents that we just haven't mobilized the right solution for this person. So we bring them in, we discharge them. We bring them in, we discharge them. And we are part of that cycle because we haven't done, we haven't identified the right problem to solve and we haven't done anything different about it. So we are working to achieve stability for these folks and the key concepts here are really hard. They're very simple to say, but they're very hard. We have to understand that management and follow-up are iterative and that, that solutions and stability are going to occur back and forth. Uh, they're going to occur over time, and people are going to come back and forth across settings over time until we move them into that phase of higher stability and lower utilization. So that's the quote we have here in the box. You can see the ultimate outcome of this collaborative and cross-setting cross process is to bring someone from an unstable cycle of high utilization to increased stability and lower utilization. So remember that concept of stability. That's what we're trying to do for these folks. Uh, finally, uh, we've got a uh, quote, uh, finally in this section, we've got a quote from a hospital that just presented at a statewide meeting in New York last week, and they said, we've gone from a hospital that was dealing with patients and crises in the moment to one where we know the patients. We're more collaborative and we work better together. All of our departments are closer, and this has extended to the community as well. And this has been the big transformation that this hospital has experienced. I'll pull out a couple key, uh, key concepts. New way was reactive and episodic. New way is they have created institutional memory and an interdisciplinary perspective about their MVPs. The, uh, Immediately, they, they, this, this work brought many different departments together uh, who hadn't specifically collaborated together, although we all think we collaborate, but they're being you know, quite honest and transparent by saying, uh, we really never had a team that involved uh, the ED social worker, the, chief, the, the nursing director of the ED, the director of case management, the director of social work, the, uh, you know, chief of, you know, the, the, the director of quality. Uh, and an analyst, you know, type of a team. And this was the first time that they had such a team at their hospital. 
working across disciplines, across departments, um, et cetera. And they were very enthused at the impact it has to bring the internal uh, internal departments closer together. And then they've uh, made some new some new relationships in the community, which was the key. Because every, every hospital has some relationships in the community. They, in response to these patients and their drivers, they made new relationships in the community that they never had before. So let me give you um, one case study and lessons learned from a different hospital that I'm working with. This is a large community hospital, very busy. Uh, it's not a teaching hospital, but it's a high, high, pretty high volume hospital. Um, you'd probably consider it on the edge of being a safety net hospital, very high Medicaid percentage. I don't think they're uh, technically classified as safety net, but um, high percentage Medicaid. Their target population, all adults with four or more hospitalizations in the past 12 months. That means all payer, all condition. Uh, they in when they ran their numbers, um, uh, they found that 427 people met that criteria over the past year, and that those 427 people collectively utilized about 2,200 2,200 admissions. And that sure enough, sure enough, that group had a 38% readmission rate. So that's really all I'm really I'm recommending. That line right there, if you can take one step after this webinar and run that one line, how many people, how many admissions, what's the readmission rate? That would be a big step forward, I think, um, even, uh, to understand the magnitude of the population at your hospital. Um, the next key um, is they developed a flag to identify the patients in real time. And I want to highlight this because it evolved over time. Uh, you know, at first they couldn't just turn on a flag, you know, tomorrow on day one when they wanted to start. So they had to put a request, you know, they had to figure out was it feasible, they put a request in. While that was cooking and going through the prioritization process, they developed a manual, you know, process to enhance their daily readmission list because y'all have a daily readmission list, right? So they, they had a query that resulted in a 7 a.m., um, daily readmission list and they just added to that query um, instead of the um, discharge with you know a prior discharge within 30 days they added to the query um, three hospitalizations in the past 12 months meaning that this was the fourth or higher hospitalization in the past 12 months so that was an easier um, immediate tool than a real-time dynamic flag in the record so again, I go into this detail because I, this is something that um, I'm sure you all have some sort of daily readmission tracker or list, or you could if you don't, and, um, and that this is something that you can add to that list, is uh, who in-house is a readmission, who in-house is a multi-visit patient. Um, as a result of that daily list, the daily list goes out to um, a dedicated high utilizer team. And again, the team is, is, is broad in the sense that, um, and this, this isn't the case at this particular hospital, but at others, they'll send the daily readmission list out to kind of all stakeholders. So the director of case management, or the ED director of, of case management, the ED nursing director, or whatever the case may be, there might be a, a broader distribution list um, and in addition, for this hospital, it goes to this dedicated high, high utilizer team. So the dedicated team responds while the patient is in the hospital. And of course, that's the goal, and they, they tell me that they're at about 78% um, getting to people while they're in-house. And what's the delta? Of course, the, um, the, the patients who come in on a Friday night who are gone by Sunday and the team isn't working on the weekends. So uh, what I always say to that is don't sweat the off hours. Just do what you can with the staff you have in place, you know, uh, during working hours. Uh, so when they engage with the person, sure enough, they, they do this um, utilization assessment. 
and uh, I thought you would be interested to know that their dedicated team is really driven day to day by a three a social worker community health worker team wit. So they have three social workers and three community health workers, and what they do is they team them up. So you know a social worker and community health worker is on a, a team together, and together those teamlets uh, meet the person in house and then follow up with them telephonically or face to face or both uh, uh, when the person leaves. Uh, again, providing services, support, linkage, reassurance, navigating, advocacy, um, all of that um, after uh, the person leaves. They know that what they're doing is they're problem solving over time. They're not just task oriented, get an appointment made, check, make a phone call, check. They are problem solving over time. They're providing services and supports and encouragement um, and connection over time. And I think, sorry, at the bottom of the slide, you can see what I highlighted, that everything that they say is effective for their patients occurs outside of the time-bound constraints of the clinical encounter. Do they get people into PCP visits and social and social uh, sorry um, PCP visits and specialist visits and psychiatrists? Absolutely, they get those medical visits done. But really, what is effective about achieving stability is they say everything that's effective occurs outside of an office visit and occurs outside of what the discharge planning process was. And that's, that's, I think, the key breakthrough here to, to really think about. OK, so their lessons learned, if they were to uh, share with you what, uh, what they have found to be most helpful over the f first year, is they would say that identifying MVPs while they're in-house is essential. Just like I said earlier, that is the hospital's best um, and most unique opportunity is that MVPs are here. And if we use the right engagement tools and strategies, we can be very effective in successfully engaging with people. The engagement, of course, is essential to facilitate successful post-hospital follow-up. So follow-up by meaning engagement, uh, long-term relationship building. So, um, so one, I guess one strategy I've seen not work is to run a list, uh, um, let's say monthly, of multi-visit patients and then ask a community outreach team to go find them. That's really the same as, you know, a community outreach, any old community outreach team, any PCP trying to engage their patient who's been lost to follow up, any payer who's trying to find someone who should be on their complex high risk management program, et cetera. So if you do that, you're not leveraging what you have. What you have is the person in front of you, and that warm engagement is something that gives me uh, great optimism about the promise for these programs being based, or initiated at least, in the hospital setting. Number two, they take, uh, this is interesting, I haven't touched on this yet, they take a continuation of care approach. So I, I alluded to this, but this has been a really interesting lesson over time. Um, early days, uh, there were all sorts of uh, permissions and, and, and signatures and enrollment in program, and we were talking about we want to put you in a, a complex care program, and we want to put you in a high utilizer program with labels and signatures, and that was um, completely a failure, not just for this team, but for many, many teams I've worked with. Fascinating. So what we've evolved to is what we're calling this continuation of care approach. It's our job and our obligation as providers to follow through with patients to make sure that they're stable after uh, they're released from our care. And so we offer to continue care for them. Um, and then in the community, if it turns out that we need to share uh, health, you know, protected health information, then they get the permissions needed. But um, but uh, often, what we're doing is following up and checking in, and that is a relationship that's allow, allowable because it's from the hospital that was the most recent provider of care. Um, a key strategy uh, when, when focusing on this population is to be proactive 
we want to outreach to them. We're going to try again. We're going to be proactive. We're going to try to help come up with ideas. Don't wait for people to ask us. Persistent and patient. And then finally, uh, something I've emphasized that they have found as well is don't over-medicalize repeated hospitalizations. Uh, in the last few minutes, I want to share with you uh, one of the newest tools emerging. Um, this is uh, a, a, across the country to improve care for uh, multi-visit patients. And in fact, this has been particularly vibrant next door to you in Maryland. So much of this work has emerged from Maryland and has been subsequently spread, um, at least to my knowledge, you know, in Massachusetts and New York. Um, uh, and is, is, is proving to be very helpful to teams like yours. So we've got um, a, just a quick taxonomy. I won't belabor it in terms of this uh, word, this thing, this entity called care plans. Um, and uh, it, of course, care managers and case managers very well know they've always had care plans. Um, we in the hospital setting, we might not have uh, care plans. We have plans of care. We have uh, discharge plans, things like this. But it's not exactly the, the, the same phenomenon. So uh, what, what I've uh, described here is the different taxonomy of care, of care plans that I see in the, um, in the field. We've got the long-term plan. This is biopsychosocial. This involves patient goals. This involves tasks and follow-up. And it's usually quite extensive. This is about management of care over time. Then there's the transitional care plan, which many of you who have transitional care programs will recognize. This is um, based on some sort of 30-day model. We're going to meet the person. We're going to follow up. We're going to ask these key things at these key points. We're going to ensure these milestones have been met over 30 days. And we're going to ensure the person is, is you know, effectively linked back to their primary care. And that is the transitional care plan. And then there's this other thing that's emerging um, called the ED care plan. And this has roots in emergency medicine and emergency department operations. Um, there are typically either formal or informal intuitive care plans, uh, for example, for people who, have, um, who present repeatedly seeking opiates, et cetera. Your emergency rooms probably know which patients to avoid giving opiates to. Um, and what that is reflecting is a knowledge of patients and their presentation and trying to inform the decision making the next time they come. Because of course, in the ED, we have so many shift changes and so many uh, staff changes that it's really hard to promote continuity, right? So the ED care plan is really meant to address that um, need to create um, uh, immediately accessible information that summarizes uh, need-to-know information for the emergency department provider so they can understand all of this that we've been talking about, repeated utilization history, the drivers of utilization, the types of services and supports that are in place for the patient, and what would your recommendations be to the provider the next time this person comes back, because they are coming back. So we might as well plan for it. Okay. So that's the purpose. It's to improve the management of the multi-visit patient the next time they come into the ED. The audience, very important to be clear on the audience, the audience are the ED staff. And the content, thus, has to be skimmable and easily digestible and action-oriented. Here is a uh, uh, ED care plan from Maryland. Uh, this uh, was a draft about six months ago. It's, they're, they're coming up with different types of drafts, but what you can see here is that they're trying to work toward a semi-structured, um, what they're now calling a patient profile, I believe, or a care plan summary or something like that. And, uh, and so what you can see is the background, the challenge. Uh, they have this interesting other component about standard of care. And then what's the recommended intervention in the ED? or in the hospital, in, again, in order to continue to problem solve and move the ball down the field, if you will, so that we're not constantly just going back to the same uh, solutions that haven't worked before. 
This uh, will be available to you as soon as the version two of the ARC um, Hospital Guide to Reducing Medicaid Readmissions is posted on the ARC website, which will be any uh, day now. So um, in summary about ED care plans, you got to keep them brief, no more than one page. This is the executive summary of the person. You need to keep the audience in mind. This is not a care manager audience. This is not even a PCP audience. This is the ED provider audience. So what is it that you want the ED provider to know that might help with that decision to admit or to discharge at the point of care? And most importantly, we are all very good about summarizing the extensive medical history um, or even the psychosocial history of these complicated patients. However, what's most unique and different is we need to summarize the utilization part of high utilizer or multi-visit patients. So I will leave you with a few recommendations for your consideration and I would be uh, ever so thrilled if you consider doing this between now and the time you come to the learning session in November. Number one, you've heard me recommend that key, that, that, that if you will, simple data poll. How many MVPs do you have? How many discharges? And what's their readmission rate? Number two, it would be great if you just did a test of change to interview um, five multi-visit patients. Do that driver of utilization approach, take that open-ended motivational interviewing approach and see what you can learn about your multi-visit patients. Next would be um, try to identify some new partners who share in the care of multi-visit patients. Again, it might be health plans, it might be behavioral health centers, it might be community agencies, housing and food and transportation or adult day or group homes. There are many um, subgroup, uh, subgroups of multi-visit patients and you might want to just start to identify three or four new partners you haven't traditionally worked with because of course in our other strategies we're having you work with SNFs and home health agencies. So uh, take this opportunity to, to expand your list of partners beyond the post-acute care clinical providers. Next is start to identify and engage multi-visit patients. For those of you who have transitional care programs, you probably are already doing this. So my recommendation is ask yourself, are we already um, engaging with and following multi-visit patients through our transitional care program? And if so, then you could ask number five, which is, do we have an opportunity to intensify the frequency or the flexibility they were helpful to this particular group of patients. So with that, I know we are uh, at time. Um, I think I see two questions. Um, in fact, just one um, uh, one question. So um, I'll, I'll take it really quickly, but understand if, if many of you have to, to hang up. We have a question related to the high utilizer team members who visit the patients. Was the community health worker on this team another social worker, nurse, or other? And did each of the two have a different role or focus? And if so, what were they? Absolutely. Um, the the, the um, social worker and the community health worker are complementary. The community health worker focuses on engagement and relationship building um, and, and uh, really home visits. And so uh, he or she is the eyes and the ears of, in the community. The social worker will do field work, but mostly works on what I'd call advanced social work in terms of that navigating, advocacy, breaking down barriers, mobilizing resources, and working on those uh, tough, challenging issues over time. So they have very different roles, and they work as a teamlet, which I think is a very nice model. So thanks so much for that question. And we'll look forward to um, taking this up um, at the in-person learning session in November. Much, much more to say about this topic. So thank you so much for your commitment to reducing readmissions, and have a great rest of your day. Betsy, I'll turn it back you. to you. Thanks, Amy, uh, for your great presentation using data, stories, and tips and tricks um, for some strategies for our hospital folks. I will remind them that there will be a pop-up window to complete a survey. Uh, to tell us your feedback about the webinar as soon as you close your browser. Thank you so much.